we talked about functions and variables in previous videos. In this video we will talk about functions and variables and in particular we will talk about recursive functions, overloaded functions and the scope of variables. We can have functions of the same name but different argument types. This uh, type of function is called an overloaded function. This is only a good idea if each one of those functions does conceptually the same thing. So for example here I define a function that's called square and it computes the square of a number. Uh, and we have two copies of this function. In one case the argument is a double and then the return type is also a double. And in the other case, the argument is an integer and then the return type is also an integer. Um, so this is a reasonable use of overloading. It means that if I call a function square with an argument that is a double, um, I'm going to get a double squared uh, in return. And if I use an integer as an argument and when I call the square function, then it's again going to calculate the square uh, and the return type is going to be an integer this time. Now obviously you cannot have the same name, the same argument but different return types, right? Because in that case the compiler will not know what to do. If I have a square constant double here and um, it ret returns a double and I have a square and double also here, but this time it returns an integer, then when I call this square and pass a, a double as an argument, it will not know which uh, of those functions to use and what to return, uh, because um, the argument is the same in both cases. Uh, if the return type is different, it will not know which one to pick. So you're creating a conflict. So that uh, would obviously not work. An important function type is uh, uh, a recursive function. Functions that can call themselves uh, are called recursive functions. Uh, a typical example of this is the factorial. So this uses the fact that n factorial by definition is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial. So let's see an example of this. So this is an example of a recursive function. We will code it up in the end. So here our argument is an integer n and the return type is also an integer and then uh, we have an if statement where if n is greater than 1 you return n times factorial of n minus 1 otherwise you return 1. So notice that th the function is called factorial so you have that function name here but that function name is also appearing here inside the function. So that means I'm calling the function itself uh, at every iteration. So in every iteration, n is going to decrease by 1, and I'm going to call that function with uh, n decreased by 1 until I reach 1, and then uh, the iteration will stop. So in general, there has to be a criterion for when this iteration will stop, otherwise it will go on forever. Uh, and in this case, the iteration stops when n equals 1, uh, and it will stop there assuming that we started with an n that is uh, positive. Uh, so let's think about this loop and think about what it will do. Um, so let's suppose I call this function with an argument that's equal to 3. So when I first call it n will be equal to 3 which is greater than 1 so it will execute this part of the loop so if n equals 3, it will return 3 times factorial 
of 3 minus 1, so factorial of 2. So we have 3 times factorial of 2, and uh, the factorial of 2 will be calculated by calling this function again. But this time the argument is 2. So we have factorial of 2, that's greater than 1, so again we will execute this branch of the if statement. So with n equals 2 we have 2 times factorial of 1. So now it's going to call the factorial function again with an argument of 1. So we're going to call here, call the function with n equals 1. Now this time the first branch will not be executed because n equals 1. So we will go to the next branch and it will turn 1. So that's because the factorial 1 is 1, of course. So if you kept track of each iteration, the first one was 3 the times 2 times 1. So that's 6. So it will return 6 in the end. In the last iteration. So that's the correct answer. The uh, factorial of the number 3 is equal to 6. Okay, we will return to this example and code it up in the end of the video just to see it. Um, so, but for now let's talk about the scope of variables. The function examples we have uh, seen so far uh, have included variables that are declared inside the function. We have also declared variables in the main function and we need to understand where these variables are visible and how long they persist. The region of code where a variable is visible is called the scope of the variable. Um, the scope is generally determined uh, by using curly brackets. Uh, for example, when you use a function or a for loop or if and else statements, uh, if you follow these with curly brackets, then you can define or limit the scope of a variable uh, to be within those curly brackets. So let's see some examples. So in this case, this code will not compile. The reason is that uh, the variable i here only exists inside here, in these parentheses and between those curly brackets uh, and the integer k again also is declared uh, between those curly brackets so it's not accessible outside the for loop so if I try and call these numbers i or k outside this loop where th they are defined uh, they cannot be accessed so if I try to print out k and i to the screen uh, the compiler doesn't know what k and i are. Uh, they're not defined outside this for loop. Um, so it cannot print them onto the screen. This code will not even compile. This code will also not compile. Uh, so the reason is that I have declared a variable s here inside this function square calculates the square of the number. Um, so inside these curly brackets here, I declare a double s and I return it and I define it. I also initialize it here. So s is equal to x squared, where x is the argument of that function. So s has a value here inside this function, but uh, not outside it. So when I try and call this function with an argument y, where y is 3.2, it will pass this 3.2 here, it will calculate s uh, by calculating x squared, and it will return that value of s, but then s will be erased from memory. So s does not exist in memory anymore, it only exists inside these curly brackets. So then if I try to print out s to the screen, that fails, s doesn't have a value. 
so this code will not work either this code will also not work um, this time I'm declaring a double s inside the main function and I'm trying to initialize it inside another function so the reason this won't work is again because s is declared in this function in the main function between these curly brackets but that declaration is not accessible anywhere outside these curly brackets so here I'm trying to initialize a variable that has not been declared so that will give an error it will not work that problem could be overcome if I made s a global variable so if I define it before all these functions if I declare it outside here then uh, this would work so let's see some examples of this uh, you can have functions uh, or you can have variables that are visible everywhere uh, from the point they are declared onwards uh, from the point where they are declared onwards uh, these are called global variables and they are declared outside any function including outside the main function um, the opposite of a global variable is a local variable so let's see an example of a global variable here I moved the declaration of s to the beginning of the program above any other function appears uh, b before any other function appears um, so here I initialize this double square function and I or actually I declare it I don't initialize it and then I declare uh, this uh, double s and if I declare this here then I can use that variable anywhere uh, in the programs that in the functions that follow so here are, then I have the main function and I try to see out s now you would think s may not have a value if I just try to call it here but before I run this command I'm running this command so this command uh, calls the square function which is uh, declared up here and it's defined here and if you remember from the previous video if I have declared a function early on then it's okay to use it uh, if I have declared it and define it later that's okay I can uh, define the function at the end of the program and that's okay I can use it as long as it has been declared uh, before I use it okay so here I am calling that function square with an argument of 3.2 so this will pass the 3.2 as argument here and uh, this function will square it and set s equal to that argument squared and it will return s but uh, previously it would uh, wipe s from memory after using it because it was a local variable but not anymore this time s is a global variable I have declared it up here so if s takes a value uh, that value is accessible from anywhere uh, inside the program so since I've called this function here and s took a value and s is a global variable then I can try and print out s to the screen and this will work uh, because s uh, assumed the value here it took a value of x squared when I called this function now uh, when should I use uh, global variables it's good practice to only use global variables for constants this is especially true in modern computing where parallel processing is important if we have multiple processors or multiple cores computing at the same time 
then uh, if a variable could be used and changed by any of these cores uh, that can lead to errors and discrepancies and conflicts so a, a reasonable use would be let's say to define a constant like p which might be used in multiple functions but it's not going to be changed so here I define a constant double p that's equal to 3.141592 and so on and uh, that's a global variable I, def I declare it and initialize it at the beginning of my program before any function so then I can simply call it from every other function that follows um, so here I call it inside uh, my main function and uh, it's accessible and if I have um, other functions below that they can also use that uh, constant uh, global variable uh, P um, so we should make such variables constant as above to make sure that they're not going to change and if uh, the program tries to change them uh, I will get some warning or some error so I know that I've done something wrong now let's talk about reserved words words with a meaning in the C++ language cannot be used for variable or function names so things like double integer long true break and so on uh, they cannot be used uh, as variable function names these are called uh, the reserve words or keywords um, and you should avoid using them obviously uh, so for example this code here will not compile because I tried to declare a variable uh, and call it double but uh, double is a reserved keyword uh, so it cannot be used uh, if you want to find a full list uh, of these Uh, reserved keywords you can go to cppreference.com and uh, slash wcpp slash keyword and uh, you will find the full list of uh, C++ uh, reserved keywords there are a few more rules uh, about names uh, for example, names for variables or functions uh, must be made up of letters, numbers, or the underscore character. The name cannot start with a number. It has to start with uh, a, diff a letter. And strangely enough, it can also start with an underscore, uh, but not a number. Um, and... Uh, the definitions are case sensitive so lower and upper case letters are distinguished from each other and uh, a, a common convention is for variable and function names to begin with a lower case letter in C++ uh, but that is not a, a language requirement and you don't have to obey this rule it's just a common convention uh, but the code will still work and compile if you uh, start with a uppercase letter for example um, sometimes if we work on uh, large projects uh, we may want to create code files for functions and uh, put these functions uh, in, in separate code files basically um, if we do that then we have to include these functions somehow and a simple way is to put the function definition in a file and then use the sharp include command to include those functions 
So for example, we could have a file uh, that's called square.cpp that just has this function uh, declaration and definition. And then um, include it in our main uh, code file and call it from there. So uh, then the main code file would look like this. Uh, for example, it could have an include IO stream uh, using namespace standard library. And then we would have uh, a line that says include and then the name of the file in quotes that we want to include. Um, so that's the function that's written in that file and we want to use. And then I can simply write the rest of my code. I don't have to declare or define the function here uh, in this file. Uh, it just reads the definition from that other file at the beginning of my program. And then I can just call that function uh, and it will call the function and run it as normal. So in general, the effect of the sla the, the, this sharp include command is to insert the text of the included file at that point. So if I write sharp include and then the name of that file, that will work as long as the square.cpp file is in the same folder as the code file in our project. So this example works just as if we had written out the function definition before our main function right here. So uh, this double square function uh, could be basically uh, replacing this line here. And uh, then this, this code will work just the same. So that's effectively what this line does. It just uh, points to that file and reads that function and places that function definition here uh, in, in place of that line. Um, you could also just include this uh, CPP file with the main function uh, in the Visual Studio project if you're using Visual Studio. Um, for larger scale projects, it is also common to put function declarations in header files. Uh, these are files with the extension .h, uh, which stands for header, obviously. Um, so the function declarations go into .h files, and then the function definitions go into .cpp files. And then all these uh, .h and .cpp files uh, are going to be included in the project. So if you're using Visual, Visual Studio, uh, you can do this uh, via the Solution Explorer. Uh, you have to remember that each CPP file that uses a function has an include statement uh, to include the relevant .h file. Um, I, in general, we're not going to do, do that for, for this class. Um, but it's good to know how this works. Uh, you can read more about uh, these concepts in the book uh, C++, A Beginner's Guide by Herbert Schild. And uh, I'll post the link below. Um, and this is it for this video. Thank you for watching.